On November 28, 1953, a CIA scientist plunged to his death from the 13th floor of a New York hotel. It was a tragic yet open and shut case. Frank also died by suicide. But something didn't add up. A 20-year investigation would reveal a CIA cover-up, the existence of a strange covert operation focused on mind control, and a shocking experiment gone wrong. At around 2.30 a.m. on a cold November morning in 1953, the sound of shattering glass was heard high above 7th Avenue in Manhattan. Seconds later, a body hit the sidewalk. Someone had jumped from the 13th floor of the Statler Hotel, crashing through a closed window. The hotel's night manager, Armand Pastor, rushed outside and found a man on the ground clinging to life. Pastor said, he was trying to mumble something, but I couldn't make it out. It was all garbled, and I was trying to get his name. By the time the ambulance arrived, the stranger on the sidewalk was dead. Pastor looked up and saw 13 floors above, a curtain flapping through an open window. He was able to identify the room. It was 1018A. Back inside the hotel, he found two names on the registration card, Frank Olson and Robert Lashbrook. When the police arrived, Pastor took them to room 1018. They entered with guns drawn. The room was empty and the window was open. They pushed open the door to the bathroom and found Robert Lashbrook sitting on the toilet, head in hands. He told the police he had been sleeping, then heard a noise and woke up. The man that went out the window, what is his name? One officer asked. Olson, came the reply. Frank Olson. In all my years in the hotel business, Pastor, the night manager, later reflected, I never encountered a case where someone got up in the middle of the night ran across a dark room in his underwear, avoiding two beds, and dove through a closed window with the shades and curtains drawn. Pastor returned to the lobby and on a hunch asked the telephone operator if any calls had recently been made from room 1018. Yes, she replied. Someone in the room had made a call. Not to police or emergency services, but to a private number on New York's Long Island. The operator had eavesdropped on the call not uncommon in an era when hotel phone calls were routed through a switchboard. Well, he's gone, the caller said. The voice on the other end replied, well, that's too bad. The number was listed as belonging to Dr. Harold Abramson, a psychiatrist who had been treating Olson. The case was open and shut. Frank Olson's family were told that he had a nervous breakdown and as a result, jumped to his death. He was buried in a closed casket and his death was ruled a suicide and forgotten until more than 20 years later when a series of investigations revealed that Abramson had been working together with Olson and Lashbrook for the CIA and a man called Sidney Gottlieb. Gottlieb was the head of a covert CIA program focused on brainwashing, mind control and psychological torture. In 1975 when the program finally came to public attention it was known as MK Ultra. Frank Olson was a bacteriologist. He graduated with a PhD in 1938 and was a member of the Army Reserves until the start of World War II when he was called to active duty. In 1942, alarmed by reports that Japanese forces were waging germ warfare in China, the U.S. Army launched a secret program to develop biological weapons. Frank Olson was one of the first scientists assigned to this new biological warfare lab at Fort Detrick in Maryland. One of Olson's first assignments was researching aerosol technologies to weaponize anthrax. Olson soon became involved in a highly secretive branch of the bioweapons lab called the Special Operations Division or SOD with the purpose of conducting research on the covert use of chemical weapons. After World War II, the bioweapons lab at Dietrich began to fade in importance. The reason was simple. The United States now had an arsenal of nuclear weapons, so developing biological ones no longer seemed urgent. 
As the Cold War began, however, rumors began circulating in the intelligence community that the Soviets and the Chinese were working on methods of psychological warfare. Then two unrelated developments on opposite sides of the world seemed to confirm these suspicions and gave the newly created Central Intelligence Agency and Frank Olson a new mission. The first incident was the show trial of Cardinal Joseph Mizenti for treason in 1949. After World War II, communism was on the rise in Soviet-occupied Hungary, and Cardinal Mizenti was a vocal opponent of communism and communist persecution. In December 1948, he was arrested and accused of treason, conspiracy, and other offenses against the new Hungarian People's Republic. At his show trial, the Cardinal appeared disoriented. He spoke in a monotone and confessed to crimes he had clearly not committed. The second came in the early 50s during the Korean War, when it was revealed that, while in captivity, many American prisoners of war had signed statements criticizing the United States, and in some cases made confessions surrounding the illegal use of chemical weapons during the war, which the US government strongly denied. The CIA came up with one explanation for both of these developments, mind control. Communists, the CIA concluded, must have developed a drug or technique that enabled them to control human minds. They had no evidence to support this belief, but the CIA were convinced and established a new research program called Project Bluebird for the study of special interrogation methods. A classified document released in 1975 revealed the project used subconscious isolation and hypnosis in an attempt to both subconsciously control an individual and protect against that type of control. These ideas seeped into popular culture and inspired the book and movie The Manchurian Candidate. This obsession with mind control also just happened to coincide with the development of a new drug called LSD. LSD was first synthesized on November 16, 1938, by Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman. Five years later, in 1943, he discovered its psychedelic properties quite by accident when he ingested an unknown amount of the drug. Hoffman's employer, Sandoz Laboratories, began marketing LSD as a cure-all for conditions ranging from alcoholism to schizophrenia. In 1953, the CIA considered purchasing 10 kilograms of LSD, enough for 100 million doses. It's unknown if the purchase went ahead, but in that same year, Project Bluebird was merged into a bigger and more ambitious umbrella project called MK Ultra, and LSD was a key part of the research. A scientist called Sidney Gottlieb, head of the chemical division in the CIA's technical services, was tasked with overseeing MKUltra, which was based out of Fort Detrick. His first few months of work were frustrating, and Gottlieb soon asked for help, leaning on the experience and the expertise of the Army's Special Operations Division and Frank Olson. At the time, Olson was the acting chief of the Special Operations Division. He had been researching the airborne distribution of biological agents. Gottlieb believed his research would be of value to MKUltra and brought Olson in as a consultant. Gottlieb and his team searched relentlessly for a way to shatter the human mind, leaving a void into which new impulses or even a new personality could be implanted. He tested an astonishing variety of drug combinations in conjunction with other cruelties like electroshock treatment or sensory deprivation. In the United States, his victims were unwitting subjects in jails and hospitals, including a federal prison in Atlanta and an addiction research center in Kentucky called the Narcotic Farm. In Europe, Gottlieb's victims were prisoners in secret detention centers, one of those centers, built in the basement of a former villa in the German town of Kronberg, may have been the first secret CIA prison. Frank Olson resigned from his role as acting chief of the Special Operations Division in early 1953, claiming the stress of the job was negatively impacting his health, and he went back to his previous job as a branch chief. But even in a less demanding role, his mental health would suffer. While working on SOD and MKUltra projects, 
Olsen had directed experiments that involved gassing or poisoning laboratory animals, and in Germany, at a CIA safe house, he had witnessed interrogations using experimental methods, combining drugs, hypnosis, and torture, in an attempt to master brainwashing techniques. Many of these subjects died, often in agony. On a trip to the UK, he visited a top-secret biological warfare center at Porton Down, where government scientists, partly funded by the CIA, were investigating the use of psychoactive drugs. There, he met psychiatrist William Sargent, who was directing the research, and Olsen admitted to being distressed by things he had seen in the course of his work. Immediately after the meeting, Sargent wrote a report saying that Olsen was deeply disturbed over what he had seen in CIA safe houses in Germany, and displayed symptoms of not wanting to keep secret what he had witnessed. He sent his report to his superiors in British intelligence with the understanding that they would forward it to the CIA. Sargent would later say, there were common interests to protect. These were worrying revelations for Gottlieb and the CIA, whose entire MKUltra operation depended on secrecy. And aside from everything he knew about Dietrich's Special Operations Division and MKUltra projects, Frank Olson had another insight that the US government was interested in keeping suppressed. Olson knew that the false confessions of American POWs about the US Army's use of biological weapons in Korea might not be false at all. A 1952 report by the International Scientific Commission, or ISC, headed by one of the foremost British scientists of the time, Joseph Needham, found that biological weapons had indeed been used in Korea, but the report was suppressed and only came to light in 2018. In the report, Needham claims that weaponized anthrax had been used on several occasions during the Korean War the very weapons that Frank Olsen had been working on at Fort Detrick. What Sidney Gottlieb did next is both shocking and baffling, and would send Frank Olsen into a downward spiral from which he wouldn't recover. Olsen received an invitation to gather on the 18th of November, 1953, for a retreat at a cabin on Deep Creek Lake in Western Maryland. Officially, it was a coming together of two groups, four scientists from the CIA Technical Services staff and five Army scientists from Fort Detrick's Special Operations Division. These were the men that ran MKUltra. Notably, Gottlieb was there along with his deputy Robert Lashbrook and Frank Olson's boss at Fort Detrick, Vincent Ruitt. The truth of what happened at the retreat would remain secret for 20 years. From the perspective of Frank Olson's family, he returned home a changed man. Olson refused to eat. He couldn't sleep and seemed distant and distracted. He refused to talk about the retreat. In a conversation with his wife Alice, he cried out, I've made a terrible mistake. Exactly what mistake, Alice Olson would never know. Less than a week later, Frank Olson would be dead lying on the sidewalk outside the Statler Hotel, having jumped from his 13th floor window in an apparent suicide. In 1973, New York Times investigative journalist Seymour Hersh was asking awkward questions about a number of CIA operations, like Project Azorian, which I've covered on this channel, and MKUltra. The director of the CIA at the time, Richard Helms, was due to retire in 1973, as was Sidney Gottlieb. Recognizing that their secrets might be compromised, the pair ordered all MK Ultra files to be destroyed. But enough evidence remained to worry Carl Duckett, the CIA's director of science and technology. In a memo, he suggested that new CIA director William Colby deny any knowledge of MKUltra. In 1974, Seymour Hersh finally published his story, revealing that the CIA had conducted drug experiments and illegal spying operations on US citizens without their knowledge or consent. In response, President Gerald Ford set up the President's Commission on CIA Activities within the United States. The Senate held its own investigation, helmed by Democratic Senator Frank Church. 
The Church Committee was a larger investigation into the abuses of the CIA, FBI, and other US intelligence agencies. The revelations were shocking and hard to believe. The Olson family finally found out what happened to husband and father, Frank Olson. When Sidney Gottlieb gathered the MKUltra team at Deep Creek Lake in November 1953, the first 24 hours passed uneventfully. But on the second night of the retreat, the group gathered for dinner. Robert Lashbrook produced a bottle of Contro and poured everyone a drink. After 20 minutes, Gottlieb asked if anyone was feeling odd. Several said they were, and Gottlieb revealed he was running an experiment and that the drinks had been spiked with LSD. The effect of the drug was profound and many of the participants were confused and upset. Vincent Ruet would report that on the morning following the experiment, Olson was agitated and anxious to leave the retreat. Gottlieb saw nothing concerning in Olson's behavior. When the meeting broke up and Frank Olson headed home, his wife Alice remembered him being withdrawn. When Olson returned to Fort Detrick on Monday the 23rd of November, Vincent Ruet recalled he was agitated and in his own words, all mixed up. Olson wanted out. He tried to resign his position, but Ruet refused and instead called Sidney Gottlieb for advice. Gottlieb wanted Olson taken to New York to be assessed by Dr. Harold Abramson. Abramson was not a psychiatrist, but he was an MKUltra initiate and had significant experience working with LSD. Olson briefly returned home, telling his wife Alice he was traveling to New York for psychiatric treatment. Olson then left for New York with Ruet and Sidney Gottlieb's deputy, Robert Lashbrook. Between the 24th and 27th of November, Abramson had a number of sessions with Frank Olson. He believed that Olson had been suffering from delusions and was in a psychotic state which had been aggravated by the experiment at the retreat. Abramson suggested Olson be hospitalized as a voluntary patient at a Maryland sanatorium. Olson and Lashbrook left the doctor's offices, registered at the Statler Hotel, and were given room 1018A. Over dinner at the Statler, Olson told Lashbrook that he was looking forward to his hospitalization. He mused over books he would read. Lashbrook later said he was almost the Dr. Olson I knew before the experiment. The two returned to their room, watched TV for a while, and lay down to sleep. At 2.30 a.m., Olson crashed through a closed blind and window and fell to his death. After the revelations in the New York Times and Washington Post, the Olson family held a press conference. Frank's wife Alice said, Since 1953, we have struggled to understand Frank Olson's death as an inexplicable suicide, she said. The true nature of his death was concealed for 22 years. They announced their intention to sue the CIA for their part in Frank's death. Alarm bells went off at the White House. A lawsuit, if allowed to proceed, would give the family and their legal teams access to even more government secrets. President Ford's chief of staff, Donald Rumsfeld, and his deputy, Dick Cheney, recognized the danger. Cheney warned Rumsfeld in a memo that a lawsuit might force the CIA to disclose highly classified national security information. To head off the disaster, he recommended that Ford make a public expression of regret and express a willingness to meet personally with Mrs. Olson and her children and attempt to secure the family silence. President Ford took his aide's advice. He invited Alice and her three adult children to the White House. On the 21st of July, 1975, they met in the Oval Office. White House lawyers offered the Olson family $750,000 in exchange for dropping their legal claims. After some hesitation, the family accepted. Congress passed a special bill approving the payment, and that would have closed the case if Frank Olson had remained quiet in his grave. In January of 1976, the government handed over a collection of previously classified CIA documents to the Olson family. They confirmed that Frank Olson's death was directly linked to the Gottlieb experiment at Deep Creek Lake. But what is not known is why Gottlieb decided to experiment on the MKUltra group. 
In 1984, the Olsen family met with Gottlieb. He claimed the purpose of the experiment was to see what would happen if a scientist was taken prisoner and drugged. Would they divulge secret research and information? Some sources claim Olsen was specifically targeted and interrogated using the techniques MKUltra had been developing. Frank Olsen's son Eric, still unsatisfied with the official version of events, waited another decade until after his mother's death before arranging to exhume his father's body. A forensic pathologist, James Stars, spent a month studying Olsen's body. His test for toxins in the body found nothing of note. The wound pattern, however, was curious. Stars found no glass on the victim's head or neck, as might be expected if he had dived through a window. Most intriguingly, although Olsen had reportedly landed on his back, the skull above his left eye was disfigured. Starr's report would conclude, I would venture to say that this hematoma is singular evidence of the possibility that Dr. Olsen was struck a stunning blow to the head by some person or instrument prior to his exiting through the window of room 1018A. In 1996, Eric Olsen requested the US District Attorney in Manhattan open a new investigation. Stephen Siracco of the officer's cold case unit conducted the investigation but concluded there was no compelling case to send to the grand jury. But in author Stephen Kinzer's book, Poisoner in Chief, Siracco is quoted as saying, if this would have been a suicide, it would have been very difficult to accomplish. There was motive to kill him. He knew the deepest, darkest secrets of the Cold War. Would the American government kill an American citizen who was a scientist, who was working for the CIA and the army if they thought he was a risk? There are people who say, definitely. The official conclusion is that in the aftermath of Frank Olson's death, the CIA staged a cover-up to hide the fact that Olson had been drugged with LSD without his consent. And LSD-induced paranoia contributed to his death, tipping an already troubled man over the edge. And while the full truth about MKUltra and the death of Frank Olson may never be known, Many, including Frank Olson's surviving family, believe that Frank was struggling with his conscience, and Sidney Gottlieb planned the experiment at the retreat to find out what Olson knew and how likely he was to talk. But after the experiment, Olson became increasingly unstable. He knew too much about MKUltra and the US Army's biological weapons program. Frank Olson had become a liability, and he was murdered by the CIA. Thanks for watching, and if you liked the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. And if you are looking for more CIA stories, have a look at my Project Azorian video.